Welcome to episode 21 of Behind the Frame. It's been a while since um, I've been able to record uh, an episode and I'm very much looking forward to sharing lots of content with you guys over the coming weeks. Um, just back from three weeks of back-to-back -back safaris, two weeks in the Masai Mara for our Great Migration Safaris, and then another eight nights in Chitake Springs and Mana Pools in Zimbabwe on a private guided safari. Um, loads of cool uh, images and thoughts and techniques and uh, things to share with you guys over the coming weeks. Um, and to start off and get back into the swing of things, I thought I'd share one of the highlights from my Great Migration Safaris. Um, it's weird. It's not a Vulibius and it's not a river crossing. Check this out. We spent just over two and a half hours with these bee eaters. Um, it is a little bee eater uh, pair and they provided us with some incredible photographic opportunities. So I thought I'd share some of the details and settings on how we were able to capture images from the sighting. First of all, check out some of the shots that we were able to achieve. Spending time with subjects like this allows you to try a multitude of various shots. Different depths of field, different shutter speeds, different interactions between the two. And really it was just great to play around and see the results. And with the light and the background and everything just coming together so nicely in this, it really was a spectacular afternoon. Now this is the, the image that I'm going to work on and uh, show you guys not only how we captured this, but how I processed it. Right, so first things first, let's take it back into the develop module and reset absolutely everything. Right, looking at the image, let's have a look at some of the details and the settings. There's a couple of things here that uh, really had to come together in order to make this work. The first is that you'll see that this was shot at f10. So depth of field is critical here. We were very close to the subjects. This was captured at 600 mils with a 300 mil lens and two times converter. So we were very close, as you can see. That means that we've got great focal length, very close to our subjects, and that results in a shallow depth of field. So F10 was um, a decision made in order to give us a little bit of extra wiggle room in terms of our depth of field. So with subjects like this, the nice thing is that you kind of have repetitive behavior. Little bee eaters have favorite perches, which they like to hunt from, and they'll often take off, fly, grab the insect, and then return to the perch. And that was a technique that we had to kind of keep in mind. And I mentioned to the guests, as soon as that bird takes off, don't take your eye away from that perch because there's a very good chance that they'll be coming back. And that's what we did. We just kept an eye on them taking off and then letting um, the guests know when they were coming back in and then rattling off frames as they came in, hoping to catch something special. I like this one because it tells a story of one of the birds coming back to provide a, an insect for the other. Um, and you can see that this one's actually got a bee in its beak. Um, so, at F10, how on earth is that background uh, so soft? Well, the simple answer is that really the background here was the Mara River. So this is actually what you're seeing there is the reflection of the opposite bank of the Mara River in the river itself. And that provided a nice dark background whilst good light was falling on our subjects from our right hand side. So we had uh, side light, darker background, the background was probably a good 40 meters away uh, down below us. And so everything came together quite nicely there. So even at F10, we don't have any uh, distracting elements. Shooting these little guys with a perch when there's grass behind or when there's other branches and leaves in the background becomes very, very difficult because you want to try and use that depth of field to isolate your subject. But with this sort of focal length and proximity, your depth of field is so shallow that you often going to fall short. Right, a couple of the other settings. Shutter speed, 1,600th of a second. Yes, too slow, I understand. We tried a full range from about a 60th of a second all the way to capping out the cameras at 8,000th of a second. Trying to tell different stories, trying to capture a little bit of movement in the frame. And it just so happened that this particular moment, which I would have preferred to either have been a lot slower or a lot faster, um, came in at 1,600th of a second. So you can see there's a little bit of movement here, not quite tack sharp. This subject, however, which is sitting still at 1,600th of a second is spot on um, in terms of m keeping that movement, uh, which was very limited, nice and sharp. But I would have liked for either probably around 200th of a second to show a little bit more movement or probably better to be at 8,000th of a second and freeze this entire scene completely. 
The other variable that we're looking at here is underexposing by two full stops. So let's have a look here in our basic panel. If we hadn't underexposed by two full stops, and we bring this all the way back, this is what the camera would have wanted to give us at a much higher ISO. Now remember the way that the camera looks at a scene in evaluative metering mode is that it evaluates everything in the scene and says, right, well, let me have a good look here. I want to keep this to gray. I don't want this to be too bright. I don't want this to be too dark. It tallies it all up and gives you an average. So in order to make the scene a lot brighter at two stops over, we would have had a slower shutter speed. Or if we wanted to keep that shutter speed, we would have had to use a higher ISO. So underexposing, you'll see, protects the highlights on these birds here. Um, and creates a nice mood. So that is the raw file. Maybe a little bit dark, but we're going to work on post-processing um, on that now. So, right, now that you understand all the variables that have come together uh, to get this shot, let's have a look at how we're going to go and process this. First thing is to crop and provide a little bit more balance and composition and story to the image. And we're going to go with something along those lines over there. You see we've got our two PowerPoints, nice composition here. So we've got the eye being led into the frame by our subject. I can pick up two little dust spots over here. And so the quick way, if you can't see them, and you probably can't on your screen here, here's some cool shortcuts. Q takes you into the spot removal tool. A will then also help you to see any spots. And there they are, quite nice. So remember the inner circle is the hard edge. And then we feather outwards from there and we say, right, we want to take care of those two spots. A again, just to double check it. And we put our spot removal tool away. Those are gone. Fantastic. Now, um, let's start on the basic panel. I want to lift the exposure on this image just a touch globally, just by a third. And I think that should do the trick. We're going to tease out some of the whites. Now, remember, when you start to underexpose intentionally in an image, you are going to be pulling the histogram over to the dark side, which means, ooh, pulling the histogram to the dark side. Anyway, um, which means that all of your whites and lights are also going to be shifted that way. So we need to kind of tease those back out. And I really enjoy shooting like this because it preserves some of those darker details and brings back uh, some contrast into the image. Um, saturation, because we're looking on the raw file, we're just going to take it to a standard of four. White balance doesn't look too far off here at all, maybe a little bit warm, so we're just going to cool that down just a touch. You see that's looking good. In the tone curve, this is where we're going to add contrast. Now remember, contrast in the basic panel is global, takes the whole histogram and goes blah. Here we're looking at four tonal ranges and we're taking the brightest and darkest elements of those tonal ranges and stretching those out. So again, looking at the lights, we're just going to tease those out just a touch. The shadow areas, we're going to drop those a little bit, and the dark areas, just a little bit. So have a look at the before and after, just with the tone curve. Do you see that that background becomes a little bit darker, and the bee eaters themselves really pop quite nicely, which is really, really cool. So very little that actually needs to be done here. Um, we're going to go and apply some lens corrections, but I don't think with the crop that we're going to see too much on there. Um, and we wanted to make this, this was, I'm not too sure why it hasn't picked up the... 300, uh, definitely wasn't a 600 F4, uh, bum, bum, 302 with a converter. And there we go. So that's been applied. In the detail panel, and this is vitally important here, we want to sharpen and mask. So let's do masking, hold down the Alt key, slide out. Remember, whatever is left as white edges is what is going to be sharpened. And in this particular instance, because our background is so far away, we're able to kind of not have to go as high as we would normally. And I'm happy just to mask to a value of 60. And we've got Lightroom standard application and amount of 40. I'm also going to apply a little bit of noise reduction because in this background here, there's a little bit of grain that is coming through. And that is pretty much where I'm going to leave it. So let's have a look at it before and after. And you'll see that most of the work was done in camera. Um, like I said, the elements that came together here was where these birds were positioned, the fact that their behavior is predictable, um, the fact that they kept us busy for two and a half hours, which is really, really cool of them, um, and the fact that that background is so far away. It's vital. Pay attention to your backgrounds and use the opportunity. So when we initially stopped, we were in a position where we actually had the river bank behind them. And it wasn't providing us with as much contrast because the bank was a lot lighter. We moved slightly forward and all of a sudden we were able to shoot down onto the subjects with the river down below being much darker, providing the perfect background.
I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode. Loads more coming your way. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop me a line, leave a comment, or hit me up on email at andrew at wild-eye.co.za. We'll catch you again next week.